Hello, everyone. This is Sydney St. James, and I would like to welcome you to Season 1, Episode 1 of The Making of an Author. In particular, myself, Sydney St. James. Three or four decades ago, I was going to Texas A&M University, and I was really big into doing family history. So I became, over a period of time, I became the, I guess you could say, the family historian, not only for myself, but for my wife's family as well. But way back then, and it is way back then, my first novel had its beginning at Texas A&M University while I was working in the reserve reading room of the library. While wearing tall cowboy boots, the weekend came up and I trudged through many small country farms in Colorado, Austin, and Fayette counties. And I dictated on a small little tape recorder the many small etched tombstones and grown-up weeds on a small recorder. The index this family history book had of over 50 cemeteries buried in the woods of old home places reflected what my good friend Bill Stein at the Nesbitt Memorial Library in Columbus once told me. It is one of the most utilized paperbacks in the archives for people searching their family histories. This happened, of course, before we ever heard the word Internet or Google. One day, Bill invited me over to the library because he wanted to show me the book that was in the archives there, and I went to see it. And I couldn't help but laugh as it was taped back together from the daily use as a reference manual. Of course, this was all before the Internet had its existence. While attending classes at A&M, I spent weekly time in the microfilm room to follow one particular family from Oldenburg and Rastetti, Germany, to Columbus and Frailsburg, where they settled down near a good friend out north of town, a man by the name of William Frails. Well, I guess I could say that I was really hard-pressed to fully explain the impact that my family descendants had in the state of Texas, and thousands upon thousands of other immigrants from Germany between the years 1836 and 1846. They came in substantial numbers. And te- I can tell you this, they really had an impact on politics, economics, and the Texas's social life that much of the things that were began a dramatic change by the 1850s. It's amazing how, as we adults, struggle during our childhood through the date-pocketed courses of history. Bored, disenchanted, waiting only for the end of that cobweb test of endurance. In later years, however, we find out that history is the most fascinating and stimulating of all areas of knowledge. We can ask ourselves, why this unfortunate paradox? Has history really changed? The answer is no. However important dates or names or places might be to an expert in genealogy or anyone else, they are not history, but they are the checkpoints and framework of history. I mention all of this because my very first novel, and now there are over 50 novels around the world for sale, is was about people, real people, blood and bones, Love and hate, strengths, passions, weaknesses, and the belief in Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, I love Texas history, and history is joys and sorrows as well. History talks about failures and successes and heartbreaks and ecstasies. So, what is history? History is power, the exercise of power, and the vacuum of power. You know, 
I was going through a bunch of different genres because as my authorship changed over the years, I progressed from historical fiction to historical nonfiction to creative historical fiction to romance novels, detective novels, um, mysteries and suspense. I even delved a little bit into some paranormal romance novels in the Storm Lord trilogy series. But at the beginning of my novel writing, creative nonfiction took a front seat. At first, while attending A&M, I tried to get my book published based on all of this family history for, I don't know, I guess 10 years. And I finally gave up and just went about another career in geophysics and explored for oil and gas in North America and South America. And then I came back and found that I really enjoyed writing. So my first novel was called In the Eye of the Storm. And later, it became known as Adversity. This novel, although fiction, is based on all the family history that I had done. is based on a true story. It follows this typical German family through the painful decision-making process to leave Germany, pull up their roots from generations of farming on the river hunt near Restetti, Germany. They fight delays from unfavorable winds traveling through the North Sea, storms that may take many lives on board their vessel, contracting yellow fever and other terrible sicknesses. And let's not forget the Indian attacks and many other adversities. The family faced one misfortune after another during their 90-day trip from Bremerhaven, Germany, to Matagorda, Texas. They didn't travel alone as faith was their most influential ally during their continued struggles against the many adversities. You know, the ups and downs of this novel, they lean on the truth. And at first, it was considered a creative nonfiction attempt since the story has been told by real people. All the events and adversities were experienced by thousands upon thousands of Germans during this time in history. There is truth in how most held firmly to faith in Jesus Christ during the many hardships suffered. This same faith is contained in the following two creative nonfiction novels in the series, Faith, 70 times 7, an autobiography of the Reverend Ada Caston Slayton Bonds, and The Rose of Bray's Bayou, The Runaway Scrape, written from the actual memoirs of Delu Rose Harris. As I mentioned earlier, there is a difference between historical nonfiction and creative historical nonfiction. Creative historical nonfiction is recognized in Canada but is not recognized in North America as far as the United States is concerned. However, I believe in taking historical nonfiction and spicing it up. Uh, you can have taglines, you can have descriptions, but the story is still true, but it's based on the truth, but with a little added flair to make it entertaining, to make it interesting in reading. Let me show you an example of creative historical nonfiction. This is a true account of this one family member that came from Germany. I take it from the first chapter of adversity. The fog is thick. My hands quickly vanish from in front of my face. What is the shadow laying before me? The muddled haze appears to be clearing for a moment. I scrutinize the silhouette. What is it? No. Who is it? Oh, my God. It can't be. It's me. Several echoes of people speaking, the words bouncingly, seemingly throughout a room with no walls, begin to be more apparent. The sounds are not clear, muffled, or corrupted. I can vaguely make out their sounds, their words, but realize 
They're crying. I don't understand. Is someone trying to say something? Mary reaches slowly and lightly brushes her motionless body with her hand. No touch. No sensations. No feel. They pass continuously through her frame as a hot knife does through butter. An unknown yet vaguely familiar voice resonates through the murkiness. Is she dying? Mary frantically walks through the cloudy vapor, searching, looking. Who said that? Have you heard about Anchor.fm by Spotify? It's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Yep, Anchor has the tools that will allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your computer. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Oh, now I remember. It's Johan. Where is he? She begins to hover higher above her body. No, I'm not dying, Johan. I turn around several times, gazing in every direction. The fog is still thick, suffocating me. I don't ascertain anyone giving me a clue as to what's coming about. I gaze more closely at my still body and visualize myself lying on several wooden crates. As I scrutinize the situation with confusion, I grasp the moment and recognize I am floating in the air and not part of my physical body. Lord, what is happening? Am I dead? If I am, where are the steps to heaven? Please, give me some sort of indication. I'm so frightened. Mary finds it impossible to steady her erratic pulse. Her thoughts continue running rampant and fade back into time when she was a little girl. Is this heaven? She begins praying to God. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I am confident he will show me the way. I see fear twisted around her heart. There is total silence. The mist begins to clear. In almost the blink of an eye, the shutters draw close. There's complete darkness. Like the nighttime without a moon. I feel myself hanging from a rope in the steerage area in total blackness. The ventilation pipes close and the hatches seal tight, preventing any light in the space. Someone or something It's pulling me down into a bottomless pit, void of any bottom. I am cold. It is wet. Where am I now? I've never been so confused. Sounds are unhampered. Mary inspects every direction. Her body no longer presents itself. This cannot be happening. I must be waking up. My body is not lying in front of me any longer. Why can't I visualize my essence? Why can't I not see Johan? Yes, I remember. My children. The sounds, once confusing, begin to clear. She could hear. She's dying. She has yellow jack. Mother, I love you. The words begin to fade away with someone crying. You're my best friend. I will miss you more than you will ever know. Who are all these people? For some unknown reason, I can feel they're looking at me and are despondent. I wish to see them. I want to. 
want to what? I can't remember. My mind is starting to take a vacation, and the light is becoming so bright, so bright. Then she hears a hymn, and the words become crystal clear. The wonderful choral group and the words, Am I to be looking for angels? Something? Or someone is telling me to stop, turn around, and bound for where the music is coming. What a delightful hymn. Mary continues to listen and turns back towards the light, anticipating the arrival of cherubs swooping down from above to carry her home to heaven. She is now grasping the moment no longer able to deny his presence and ready to accept God's invitation. She begins moving expediously and concedes. What is this? Unseen hands are grasping my gown, pulling me back, back in the direction from where the music was coming? Let me go. Stop. Why are you doing this? I am again confused. Is this my eulogy plan? Do I continue into this light? Should I struggle? If so, against what? The light? The darkness? Should I give in to strength of those pulling me away from the brilliance? Can I compromise with the light and the undetected arms holding me in urging me to return to the light. Never has a decision been so difficult to make. Mary fights to control her swirling emotions. Well, that was a snippet from adversity, and I guess it kind of shows you this really happened. She traveled. She was on board a vessel from Bremerhaven, And she caught yellow fever and everyone thought that she was going to die and the family surrounded her and there was water standing in from a recent storm. All sorts of adversities were affecting her. And to show how she almost died or did die, and you'll have to read the book to figure out if she makes it or not, but that's creative nonfiction. The event actually happened but spiced up with a little entertaining taglines and whatnot. So that was the making of my very first novel called Adversity Face to Face. Well, I hope you've enjoyed Season 1, Episode 1 of Making of an Author, Sidney St. James. Our next episode will look at the book called Faith, 70 times 7. It is a an, another creative historical nonfiction novel based on the autobiography of the Reverend Ada Caston Slayton Bonds, the first ordained minister in the Louisiana Presbytery and the sixth ordained minister in the United States. It is a true story, and it just so happens that she was my grandmother, a remarkable woman. See you again. Happy listening from Sydney St. James.